financial freedom is a lie. Here's what the top 1% know that they're not sharing with you. This is something I've shared with my multi-millionaire clients and it will change your life as it has changed theirs. I put together this presentation and I've charged thousands of dollars for it, but I'm gonna give it away for free right now. Enjoy. I hope it blows your mind and I hope you get and learn something new. Let's roll the video. All right, guys, I wanna tell you to F freedom and you need to do this instead. Everyone talks about freedom. I'm sick and tired of people talking about freedom. Guys, freedom is just the beginning step of your journey to really becoming your highest and best version of yourself. So my name is Vikram Raya cardiologist, high-performance coach, real estate investor, and I'm going to take you down a journey of how to become an exponential MD. I call it exponential because there's a level beyond just meeting the basic needs. There's a level beyond just entry-level success. There is this next level that we're going to get into. So I gave this talk at a conference we did in Salt Lake City called the Physician Wealth Summit by one of my companies, Viking Capital. But I'm going to get into it, guys. It's going to hit hard. Put some comments in the box below. What is your number one takeaway point from this? Guys, it'll really help me do more videos for you guys. So let's get into it. Quick uh, summary. Trained at Georgetown, physician, cardiologist. Really wanted to get into this space because I had family members who died of heart attacks. Super important. At some point in my journey, I got fed up with traditional medicine, wanted to do something different. I wanted to reverse disease instead of just manage it. Created a company called Limitless MD, boutique concierge functional medicine clinic to reverse disease. Successful. But then I was like, hey, I'm tired of just having one stream of income. How do I create multiple streams of income? Create a company called Viking Capital and was able to grow my multifamily commercial real estate company. Now we have about $700 million of real estate done 23 syndications. Then I'm at the point where how do I pay it forward? How do I help other doctors unlock their potential. And so I decided to do, I just sort of start coaching consulting just casually. And then it led to another company called Limitless MD. So that's my story. But bottom line is all of this doesn't mean anything unless this can really help you guys elevate to your next level. So with that said, let's get started. People I like listening to is Joe Rogan. He has a phenomenal podcast, a lot of really good gems of truth and wisdom. But I love this quote. If you want to live the life of your dreams, it's time to go full throttle or no champagne pain bottle. So guys, there's a nice balance between hustle and flow. And if you can balance those two things, you really can uh, achieve what I call escape velocity in life. See, we have this inertia, this gravity that holds us into what we're supposed to do. And we revolve around our typical mainstream goals. But at some point we decide, we get clarity and we have conviction and we take actions that are beyond our capabilities even. And we go to the edge of our potential and then our potential expands. And then we can live that next level life, that exponential life. So many of you guys are physicians, entrepreneurs. You're going down this journey. There's a lot of excitement, enthusiasm, even if you're a W2 person, but you're trying something new, there's enthusiasm and then boom, obstacles, struggles, challenges come and you're like, what do I do? What do I do? Many people quit at this point, guys, right here. Many people quit, but the few who don't are the ones that, that get all the prizes at the end and you start solving the problems. Remember 5% of the time spent on the problem, 95% of the time spent on the solution. So you just bust through, you persevere, you focus and you break through, you get mentorship, you get ideas, advice, and then boom, you get to that point where you overcome your challenges and you explode your company, your growth, your income, your revenue. So a lot of people, again, before I talk to you about what's beyond freedom, which is again, in my opinion, sort of the basic starting point for what we need to chase. We need to figure out what that looks like. So I've sort of come up with eight levels of freedom from level one of not living paycheck to paycheck, right? You're able to just have some stability there to level two, you get enough money to quit your job, but you have to go back because there's not, you run out of money. Level three is you can be financially happy, but you have to live below your means and you have to save a lot. Then finally you have some time you're able to work part time and, but you still have to work. That's level four. Level five is you can live a basic, simple retirement. Nothing crazy, but you're able to have a house, you have your cars, you can take one or two vacations a year, um, but nothing extravagant and take it easy. Level six, you could actually retire well. You can even, you can maintain your current lifestyle without working and hopefully your lifestyle is elevated. You can, you know, fly first class. You can take luxury vacations. You have a nice home. You don't have to downsize. This is great. Level one through six. Great. Then let me introduce you to the 
real retirements, level seven, level eight, enough money for a dream retirement. When you retire, you actually have more money than when you're working. You can create a conservatory in Africa for elephants. You can literally, you know, you're out of the rat race. You're thinking big. You create a school for blind children, right? In India, you're able to buy homes for all your children after they graduate college. You literally are able to do your passions, your projects, your hobbies, your, you know, extreme sports, all of it because you've figured it out. And then finally, level eight, this is the Elon Musk, Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos level, more money than you can ever spend, right? So if we do all these things, if we figure it out, I've been preaching something called the five freedoms for a while. And what that looks like is financial freedom, obviously. Next is time freedom, right? Then you have geographic freedom. You can work from anywhere in the world. Then it's a mindset freedom. You're resilient. You're equiposed. You're starting to become unshakable in your viewpoint, whether it's divorce, death in the family, business challenge, you can handle, you're resilient. And then finally, vitality freedom. Not only are you increasing your health span, your lifespan, your anti-aging, you have the energy and the youth of a person in their 20s and you are literally have an athlete level body. That's This is what I think is a legendary life. But the question really becomes, I've gone to this on previous things, financial freedom. I, there's levels here. There's time freedom. There's a couple of levels here. Geographic freedom. There's some levels that I've created. Mindset freedom, vitality freedom. We can talk about that. But assuming you get it all, you get it all. You get the vitality freedom. You get the geographic freedom. You get mindset. You get wealth. And you get time. What does that look like? That's success. This is the success that we've all been chasing. It's fulfillment. It's legacy. It's an epic life. But now what, right? And there's something called the success ladder. And let me talk to you about it. And if you're listening to this, if you're listening to this YouTube video or podcast, you're not going to be one of these people on the lower rung here. And it's interesting when you're good and you hit your goals, what kind of results you get? You don't get good results. You get poor results. And when you're great, when you hit your goals, what do you get in return? You get good results. And then there's what we call, there's a line up to excellent where, you know, even excellence, a good, it's, it's a high level of playing. It's a good standard to live by, but still it does not give you all the rewards. And a lot of times what's motivating the people on good, great, and excellent is extrinsic, the car, the house, the vacations, the status. That's what, that's, that's what's fueling people, things outside of themselves. But then there's the people that are playing the game because it's what they're meant to do. It's their derma. It's their zeitgeist. It's their major transformed a purpose. It's why they're put on this earth. And it's an intrinsic pull toward greatness. And this pull allows them to play an outstanding. They have the highest standards. It's not good enough just to be better than everyone else. They got to be better than they were before, the day before, the week before, the month before, the year before. And finally, you play at Limitless. So if you're able to play at these higher echelon levels, then I want to invite you and ask you the question, now what? You hit your freedoms, now what? This is for those people who are curious to see what does life look look like if I've mastered these five categories of life. So let me introduce you to these multi-millionaire frameworks. I've always thought about income as like, okay, what's my income? My W-2 income, right? That's your professional income in most cases. Then there's portfolio income. This is your second level income. Okay. I've gotten excess income. I need to invest. Then I look at things like just stocks and bonds and, and and I start, you know, mutual funds and I put extra income that I've earned that I don't need to spend into these things so they can grow without me. Fantastic. But then let's talk about passive income. Is there ways where I can earn money while I'm sitting on the sofa watching Netflix? Is there a way where Saturday morning I'm getting income even though I'm not working? Yes. We can think about things typically like real estate or online courses or other things that are intellectual property, royalties, all these things that are bringing money in. Silent partnerships where you're the money partner and someone else is doing all the work, right? Franchises, okay? So that's passive income. Now, okay, I'm, you're starting to get income. Remember, the average millionaire has eight to nine streams of income. Let me ask you a question right now. How many streams of income do you have? Are you at one? That's highly risky. Are you at two? Are you at three? You know, I'm able to, I think at this point, I think we have like 45 to 55 streams of income right now that I've been able to cultivate. And this is protective. So if any one income turns off because of the economy, because of the recession, because of the correction, because of the job situation, because of COVID, you're protected. So let's start 
increasing your streams of income, shall we? All right, professional I talked about, your W-2, your main job, portfolio, you're starting to diversify stocks, things, then your passive. What's your passive? You're starting to get real estate or intellectual property or online courses or other things like that. That's where most people start and stop. Let me introduce you to two more incomes, your passion income and your purpose income. There's a time where you're making enough money, you're doing quite well, where you start doing things you love to do. Let's say you're an artist and you, you know, I have a friend and she's an artist and she loves doing these amazing paintings and she does it because she loves it and it fulfills her and it's her creative expression. But they're so good that art galleries are asking, hey, can I display them for you and can we sell them and things like that? So now she's making money from that. Like I love coaching. I love getting into it with people and learning about their story, their characteristics and what makes them drive and how I can unlock their highest potential. And so they can go to that thrive state, right? That fulfills fills me. Like I would do this for free. And I was doing for free for many years until people said, dude, what are you doing? You should be charging for this. I'm like, oh, okay. So that's a passion income. And then eventually you can have purpose income where I'm at the point when I'm going to share you a strategy later in this presentation. So stay tuned till the end. I know this is going to be a ton of value I'm throwing at you. So again, I appreciate you guys tuning in, paying attention and, and listening to some of this stuff because it's stuff I've gleaned and learned from the best of the best millionaires, mentors, entrepreneurs, eight-figure doctors. This is the where I've gotten a lot of this stuff. I've read over 250 books on self-development, business, mindset, success, wealth creation. And this and some of all the experiences I've had for running three separate companies that I've been able to distill down and, and hopefully share with you guys. And if it's helpful, please leave some comments below because I'm trying to pour myself into you guys as I'm making these videos here. So with that said, purpose income, you could create a nonprofit. And this nonprofit is really because you want to do good in the world. Check this out. Perhaps the nonprofit invest in one of your other companies or invest in something that you already invest in, like a real estate. And the profit from the real estate is what you, what you you use for charity or your good deeds or your the nonprofit work versus the actual base amount that you invested in the nonprofit. It's essentially an infinite charity. And I'll talk about that strategy in a second. But these are the five incomes. And I suggest you start earning all of them. I realize that there are certain common themes of doctors and entrepreneurs who are really successful. And I'll break it down into these 11 steps. You should have at least 75 to 80% of these 11 things to be successful. And if a lot of these things are starting to not be there, this is when I see people run into problems and they plateau or they peak. And remember, the goal in life, never, never, never peak. So number one, confidence and clarity. How do you get that? You got to infuse that into your body. You got to read the books. You got to do the work. You got to embody it before it actually you see it in the outside world internally. Number two, you got to plan, create a strategic plan, create a game plan, one, three, five, seven, 10, nine, and lifetime game plans. Perhaps specialized knowledge, whether it's real estate or anything else, you need specialized knowledge. In this case, you know, I took on real estate knowledge. I did not learn this in medical school. No one taught me this in undergraduate. When I went to school, this was not given to me, but I realized it was very valuable. And once I learn it, like if I went bankrupt today, you took everything away from me. One, I can go back to being a physician. I could go back to being a cardiologist and get my income. Number two, I've learned enough where I can be a coaching consultant again. Number three, I've learned so much different things in real estate. I can form another real estate company and get started from scratch with zero capital because I've learned how to raise capital. I've learned how to be creative with my financing. So I feel feel so free because of this knowledge and this actions and this capability and experience. Number four, mentorship. Why is that important? Because there are times where I didn't believe in myself. I thought I had peaked. I thought I maxed out, but that's never the case. Who you are is who you surround yourself with. And that's what will influence who you become. If you're around people who are smarter than you, richer than you, fitter than you, more successful than you, it creates a drive, right? It creates a stimulus in your brain to ignite to move forward. And so I have to thank so many mentors in my life. I've been coached by business mentors, mindset mentors, coaches, people who've helped me create business systems. They have believed in me. They whispered the positivity in me before I even believed in myself. That's why it's so important. The other thing I found with mentorship is it collapses time. You know, I'm going to turn 45 this year, but I feel like I've lived three lifetimes because I've been able to do so much in such a compressed amount of time because I didn't have to go through mistakes and trial and error. I've been able to shortcut a lot of that. Have I made my own mistakes? 
Absolutely. But I've learned from those and it's created an amazing experience. But I've avoided a ton of mistakes, avoided a ton of seven figure mistakes because I've had wise guidance and counsel. All right. Number five, time. Guys, you must use your time wisely, manage your time, focus your time. Your time is one of your most precious resources and use it very intelligently and it will get you to your goals. Proper analysis, right? Analysis of challenges, analysis of deals, analysis of partnerships, all that's important. Capital. Running out of capital is shooting yourself in the foot. You need to have capital, whether that's your own or, or what we call OPM, other people's money. Learning how to raise capital, finance deals, finance investments, finance your home, finance projects, and get yourself to profitability quickly is a, a very important skill set. Next, perseverance. Perseverance is necessary. You will run into walls, brick walls, steel walls. And the question is, what do I do next? Well, you need to go around, under, above, or break through. This is a learned skill set. There are times where I wanted to quit. There's a time I cried. Not even I wanted to cry. I did cry. There are times where I'm like, why me? The phrase is not why me. It's more like, try me. Bring it on. Let's go. Is that all you got? I can I can handle it. Come on. And this is cultivated in the mornings, morning routines. This is cultivated by reading positive books. This is cultivated by physically working out your body to peak physical state. There's a intrinsic connection between physical practice prowess and mental prowess. So perseverance is something needed. The greats, Michael Jordan, LeBron James, Giannis, the tennis greats, the soccer greats, all these people have utilized perseverance. And because the skill sets are all the same, the capabilities are usually overall the same. It's this X factor that helps them get to that next level. Nine teams. If you don't have a team, you will not get to your dreams. If you don't have a team, you're essentially working for yourself. You're the worst boss to yourself. So by me realizing early on, share my some of the profits, reinvest in the team and, and scale and be generous by giving salaries, by giving bonuses, by creating structure, by giving responsibility in an intelligent way, delegating, not abdicating, but delegating. I'm able to create teams of people who are marching in unison toward the same vision that I have. And I'm able to get to my goal a lot faster. Teams are critical in companies, in your life, all of that. Next is stamina. Do not run out of steam. So there is is a story someone told me one time. Uh, it was one of my mentors. And he said, there's three types of people in the world. There are people who, who sprint and they run really fast toward their goals and they poop out, they get tired and they rest. And then eventually they get another inspiration and they recuperate. And then they boom, they sprint again, they hit another goal and then they take a break and relax and take it easy and then and so forth. Number two, there's a person, they're not very fast at all. They do the marathon. They're chugging along, light sweat, nothing major. They move pretty slow, but they're like a turtle. They keep going. You can't stop stop them. They keep going. And it's a nice, steady little march. Then there's the third type. There's a third type, Vikram. Which kind? I've never heard. I thought you sprint or there's a marathon. Well, there's people who sprint the marathon. Ah, the third type. What does that mean? It means there are people who are able to keep an accelerated pace, not a breakneck pace as a sprint person, but they're a lot faster than the typical marathoner running really slow. And they're able to sprint the marathon. They're able to have sustained greatness for decades versus days. This is a person that can keep this high octane level of productivity, of output, of, of, of growth, and they're able to sustain it. To be honest with you, one of the things I admire most is people who have shown sustained greatness. Anyone can win one championship. Anyone can win one match. Anyone can win you know, one season even, or they have one successful company. How is it that Richard Branson has 500 successful companies? How is it that Tony Robbins dominating in eight different categories, one of the most charitable people I know, he's able to coach some of the best people in the world. He's influencing politics. He's influencing health and wellness. He's influencing finance. He's coaching millions of people all over the world and he's running all these different companies. How are these people able to do that? They've been able to create this stamina. And then finally, business system. If you don't have a system, then you're the secret sauce. You can't sell it. It's not worth anything and it's not scalable. Remember LGS. What does that stand for? Leverage, growth, and skill. You must be able to do all three things to really rocket yourself up and create something of significance. Do you want your company to be around in 50 years, 100 years? You must consider these business systems. And we'll talk about that. So that will lead to having multiple seven or eight figure companies if this is of interest to you.
But regardless of whether you want to create multiple seven or eight figure companies, or you want to take one company and make it huge, or you just want to take your nonprofit and make it like have the impact you want, or you want to take your medical clinic and, and be able to influence instead of thousands of people, millions of people, or you want to take your skill set and take it online and make a dent in the universe, you need these philosophies. So one of the things that people who go beyond freedom have achieved is going from an owner to an operator. What does that mean? This is really an identity shift. You need to go here because the rewards are amazing. So I just came back from Egypt. I was on the Nile River and I was like gone for almost two weeks and I had turned off my Slack messaging. I had turned off my WhatsApp. I had turned off my email. My cell phone, I essentially put do not disturb for almost two weeks. And it was beautiful because the lieutenants in my companies, the directors of all my divisions, they were able to run things without me. My clients were trained and were addressed. In fact, I made more money during those two weeks than the two weeks prior when I was there actually. And I I've done this for about 30 days. I've done about 60 days. My next test is to get to the 90 days. So essentially, if you can walk away from your company for 90 days and come back more profitable, you've really achieved what I call complete ownership versus being day-to-day -day operator. So at the beginning, listen, I get it. You're going to wear a variety of hats, right? You're answering the phones, you're mopping the floors, you're doing the presentations, you're trying to get the big deals, but you need to start thinking about how to build a cross-functional team. You need to think about acquiring new skill sets like accounting and financial statements. You need to eventually take on the psychology of a leader and learn your superpowers. Focus on what you do best, delegate the rest. Next, learn to make personal sacrifice at the beginning. What I'm telling you now is after years of sacrifice, I envisioned this five years down the road and now I'm starting to see it come into fruition. Short-term sacrifice, obviously you're gonna work long hours. You know, Your family sometimes has to feel the pinch because you're being spread so thin. But remember, there's no such thing as work-life balance. There's work-life integration. So guys, I work a lot. I work really hard, but then when I'm off, I am off. So I shut down at a certain time and it's amazing. I'm there. I'm taking my kids to their soccer practices or basketball practices. When we have date night every week with my wife, I am I put a phone in a special box and I take off my Apple watch. And so I am trying to be as present as possible. It's not the amount of time you spend with the, your family. It's the quality and the presence you can give them. That's what they're craving. So guys, if you eventually, and then you start thinking after you make the sacrifices, you start creating systems and efficiencies, then you start seeing the early examples of freedom. Then you start investing yourself. First, you pay yourself, which is very important. Uh, paying yourself first is important once you're able to, but you got to also fuel the business for its growth. And so reinvesting the business is very important, especially in the infant and teen phases of the business cycle. Then once you stop putting off typical fires, you do what I call NUI time, not urgent, but important. What's the one thing that's going to grow my company? company to 3 million or 5 million or 10 million or $20 million of revenue. What's the one thing that if I did that, I'd triple my customer base. And so this is the Pareto principle. You know, what's the 20% of the things that get you 80% of results, but I want you to go extreme Pareto principle. What's the one thing you can do to get you 99% of your results, right? We move on to building the right team. We talked about teams already in the past, so I'm not going to get into it, but essentially this team you surround with, each of them is almost has their own superpower skill set. And that fits with the division that they're working in, investor relations or a customer service or something, this person is very outgoing. And then I use something called the DISC score, D-I-S-C score. It's a personality score. So I'm custom picking out someone who has the four A's, attitude, aptitude, ambition, and appearance, and combining that with their DISC score, D-I-S-C. Are they D, dominant driver, really go-getter, leader, or are they I, a really outgoing extrovert, a people person, or are they SC, super detail-oriented, analysis-oriented? And based on these couple of things and other other strategies, I'm designing and constructing and architecting this team around me. And then I use KPIs uh, or OKRs, right? Objective key results or KPIs, key performance indicators. And you create a sort of a dashboard, what I call a CEO dashboard. So if you're, you know, if you're in the middle of Venice on a gondola, you can check on your phone how your companies are doing in less than 30 seconds. So I remember I was talking to a mentor of mine and I was like, you know, I'm so excited. Just can't wait, man. I'm taking Viking. 
my real estate company, we're starting to acquire assets and it's feeling good. And now almost I'm in my seventh or eighth year of Viking Capital and we're at about $700 million of acquisitions. I'm like, man, I'm going to hit the holy grail. I'm going to hit a billion. And he comes to me and says, dude, the game starts at a billion. I'm like, what? So it's interesting, right? Some of your goals are really the entry points of the next level of your growth. This is what I've learned that there's sort of a billionaire code out there and sort of it's a mindset and each level of growth from revenue from zero to 40, 40 to 100, 100 to 300, million, three, 10, 30, 100 and beyond, you have an evolution of who you are of how you spend your time, of how you delegate, of how you create your team, the kind of business systems in place, your company culture, how you can how you can scale and eventually legacy and contribution. So you got to think about it. And depending on what level you are, there is a main theme and a main strategy. So talking to people who've created multiple and seven, eight figure companies, this is what they've said. When you start your first company, that should be in your superior zone of gen- genius. And it should be what I call an elf company and not a half company. An elf company is easy, lucrative, and fun. It's you enjoy being there, time flies, and you're in your zone of genius, not just your zone of excellence. Zone of excellence, there's multiple things that we're really good at, but there's so your zone of genius is where you're so good at it that it's unfair advantage compared to anyone else. You're effortless for you to spend time there and it's in your zen. So that's your zone of genius. And if you're able to take your zone of genius and do what sort of a hell yes kind of thing, then your business becomes elf, easy, lucrative, and fun. Many times we struggle and we fight and we focus on things that we shouldn't. And those are called half companies, hard, annoying, lame, and frustrating. And I'll give you an example. There's three companies that I've launched. Limitless MD, Elf Company. Viking Capital, Elf Company. Vitology Institute. I was early in my business experience, business entrepreneurship. Highly successful zone of excellence, but not necessarily my zone of genius. There's a couple of reasons why I didn't have an integrator. I was, my business model was very fixed where I had to be physically there, essentially uh, impinging on some of my freedoms. And I was running multiple companies while I had to be really be there for that company. And that company was a health and wellness company. So I noticed it was more of a half company. Now, could I make it an elf? Absolutely. But when I already had two other elf companies, sometimes, so I transitioned that into a, an elf company. I made that into completely virtual online and I've taken myself out of it. And now it's essentially automated health and wellness services now, anti-aging, functional medicine, detox, biohacking now without me. And I've converted into an elf business. So that's number one, converting half businesses into elf businesses and realizing that. Number two, when you have more than one business, let them be complementary. And so I'll give you an example here. Viking Capital. Initially, it was just a vanilla, hey, I want to buy apartment complexes and we raise capital. We eventually started niching down. Hey, I'm a physician. There may be other physicians who want to create financial freedom, who are looking for multiple streams of income, but they don't have the time to do it. I can help them by them partnering and them investing alongside us in these assets. And I started Limitless MD, a company for physicians who want to be successful, a company for physicians who are hitting a plateau of some sort and they want to go to the next level. There is no significant physician coaching company in the world out there that's really taking care of high performance physicians. And so I created Limitless MD. Now, people who are my or in my coaching ecosystem or universe, they end up investing in Viking Capital. So this is an example of businesses being complementary. All right, the next concept is who, not how. What does that mean? Well, the problem with most people out there is they want to do everything themselves. Physicians are guilty of this. They think that if they don't do it, it's not going to be as good. Uh, you know, the product is going to be less. They are they are prisoners of perfection. For them to trust and delegate out is a weakness. And what that means is it fo- forces them to stay small, to stay limited, for them to be their bottlenecks and them to thrive in their bottlenecknes, I guess, if that's a word. But the key really to success is like, hey, look, this is my zone of genius. Let me get other people to do things. And if I come up across a business problem, it's not a how problem, it's a who problem. So who can I get who knows how to solve this problem? And do I get them as a consultant? Can I get their advice? Can they bring them into the company? Can I assign this task to somebody? And can I delegate to somebody? That's been a very critical stepping stone in in creating multiple seven, eight figure companies. Next is innovation. You must continuously innovate. You must come up with new products, new services, new ways of offering things and keep it where you have a pulse on your customers. Ask them what they want. Survey them. Reach out to them. Is, Is there an exit interview when patients leave you or when clients leave you or investors leave you? you? Is there um, when they people when they join, hey, what was it about some of our marketing that really attracted you that allows you 
to sort of double down. So surveying and then coming up with innovations. And it doesn't have to be like groundbreaking or disruptive. It could just be a slight iteration. And so this is where I'll introduce you to my 3i methodology. First, you iterate. You see someone else out there who's in your field, who's in your competition, and you like what they're doing and you imitate them. Number one is imitate. You really imitate them. That's okay. But after a while, you're like, you know what? I like what they're doing, but I can slightly improve it. And that's called iteration. And then finally, you're like, you know what? Just come up with an amazing idea. I'm in the shower. Hot water's coming on my face. And then I'm like, dude, why don't I just shiv it and pivot here? Boom. And then you create innovation. So first you imitate, then you iterate, and then you innovate. So that's how you can incorporate the innovation into your game plan. Next, creating raving fan customers, guys. If you create this in my company, we've used certain buzzwords. And so, you know, I use the word Four Seasons or Ritz Carlton. And I want to create that because if you've ever been to those hotels, I mean, literally, they they treat you so well. They treat my children so well. They they take care of my bags. And like, you know, even sometimes when I try to tip them, they're like, no, 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 no I, just, I really want to help. And they have like a, a secret database that they've built to where they know their clients' preferences. They know what kind of newspaper you want, what kind of dessert you like. Do you like to stay on the ocean view or the garden view. They know what type of restaurants do you want. They know that you want four bottles of water in your room before you check in. Creating all of this information on your customers, they will stick with you even if you charge more. Next is strategic reinvestment into marketing. Marketing is huge. Most people neglect marketing. In fact, top until you hit a million to two million to five million dollars revenue, you really just focus on marketing and less on product innovation. Eventually, you're at the point where you're just getting enough people. Instead of one product, let me have two or three or four or five products. Study your market and grab market share, right? That's very, very key. Studying your market share and grabbing market share from your competition. When you Once you've grown enough, you get to the point where you're one of the behemoths in the space. The only next way to grow is to actually take it from your competition. And that's okay. You're not taking it because you're doing something illegal or you're tearing them down. You're just offering a better product. So they want to work with you. They want to come to you. Uh, keep an eye on emerging opportunities. Always, there's always trends in industries, trends in the economy, trends in the world. You want to be aware. You want to be cognizant of all that. And then finally, you want to build that team. This is the third time, guys, I've talked to you about building a team, but you really want a team of all-stars. Never accept B players. Never accept C players. If you're wondering whether you should fire someone or, or the fact that they're just not playing at a level, then it's probably time. You need to start looking for the replacement. How do you know? when you have an A player on board or an all-star, as you mentioned. You know because within the first seven to 10 days, you breathe a sigh of relief because this person just gets it and they're just performing it. And sure, they need some training and onboarding, but they just get it. So if you don't get, if you don't have that, they may be still okay, but they're definitely not an all-star. There's two options at that point, coach them up or coach them out, okay? All right, guys, elite athlete mindset. What does this mean? I've shared a ton of information at this point, guys. I've really given you hopefully some really tactical information, some strategic information, some motivational information, but really I'm painting a picture of this high performance lifestyle. And one of the challenges with having a high performance lifestyle is you run out of steam. Remember, I talked about sprinting that marathon. How do you do that for a year, for two years, for five years? Well, on top of all the other stuff you're doing, you sort of need a challenge. And this could be a mindset challenge or a physical challenge. And I'll give you an example. You know, um, yes, last year, uh, I climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. And so it was one of my big challenges for the year. And so it forced me to then use my time, obviously, with family, with my businesses, with whatever my own personal situation. But I was also starting to train for this big, huge feat, you know, climbing close to 20,000 feet, low levels of oxygen, one of the tallest mountains in the world, right? It, it just gave me an edge. It forced me to just push myself to the boundaries and actually doing it and physically doing it. I feel like killer instinct, this edge that many other entrepreneurs or physicians don't have. You know, every year I'm doing this. This year I'm doing Brazilian jiu-jitsu. It's, it's, I'm getting trained by one of the top Brazilian jiu-jitsu experts in the world. And he happens to be in DC and he comes to my home and he trains me. Why am I doing that? Do I actually have time two hours a week to do that? I don't. I've made the time. I've constructed time. I've architected this time for myself because I feel like it's just that physical edge I have. So I'll give you an example. 
I know a lot of my coaching clients or or some colleagues that I know, they run marathons, right? I've had several close friends do TED Talks, and that's a huge accomplishment. You have to train, you have to present, you have to practice, you have to optimize your public speaking and be in a concise way because it's only 18 to 20 minutes. There's something called Everesting. I have a coaching client here who um, wants to essentially climb Mount Everest, and it's essentially there's a mountain they choose, and everyone has 36 hours to climb 29,000 feet. So you go up, go down, go up, go down, and essentially you do that in a weekend. And it's absolutely amazing. There's something called the project where essentially Navy SEALs training. One of my mentors, Bedros Koulian, has this intense boot camp. I think it's 75 hours straight Navy SEAL training and mindset training. It's crazy. Next strategy is anti-aging and longevity. So Tony Robbins has created a phenomenal book called Life Force. All these breakthrough things on precision medicine. Mark Hyman has a book called Young Forever. I'm reading Peter Atia's book right now called Outlive the Science of Art and Longevity. But essentially, you're rethinking the fact that aging is inevitable. It's actually optional. I mean, we will get chronologically older, but biologically, do we have to? Well, guess what? The answer is no. You can, in many cases, aging is treatable and reversible. So really with the advent of something called epigenetics, which essentially shows you that it's not just the genes and their expression into proteins, but things on the outside, your factors, your environment, what you eat, who you're around with, your parents' experience can help influence these genes expression and you can turn things around and you can express in different ways. What I recommend is adapting an anti-aging lifestyle. Maybe consider you know one or two meals per day periodically where you have some caloric restriction. You're moderating your alcohol. You're going on a no sugar, no caffeine fix occasionally. You have eight hours of sleep. You're exercising weight training at least 150 minutes a week. You're doing cardio or HIIT training. You're doing flexibility training, right? Guys, if you can make it till till like 2025, 20, 2030, I think we'll be able to live easily to 120, 150 and beyond and have that high quality of life. So we're really on the brink of the next breakthrough, guys. And energy, anti-aging and longevity are the next breakthrough in your vitality. All right, guys, parenting and relationships. Vic, why the heck do you have parenting and relationships in this uh, journey to becoming an exponential doctor? If you don't figure out your relationships in life, you're going to live a very lonely life, a very limited life. Really, the joy of, of being a man or a woman is in surrounding yourself with people you love who care about you and if you're married and if you have kids then it's so important to have that bond with your children to influence them in a positive way to help them elevate help them figure out their own mission in life kids are are just yours for just a brief amount of time then they're going to move on so you want to maximize that experience and never 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 live with regret with that said there's uh dr shafali uh has this concept called conscious parenting. And I'm really trying to dive deep into it. And she has another book called The Parent Plan, which is really good. But it's essentially, you know, these people that you're raising, especially your children, they're not just mini me's, for example, they're their own unique people. They have their own unique signature in life. You got to value the time you spend with them. You want to create magical experiences. That's why even if it costs money, I'm doing whatever it takes to create these magic moments. And it's not just about the money you spend when you're there and you're with them and you're locked in and you're engaged age and they feel you and they hold your hand and you're with your children and they understand that you got their back. That's what it's about. You know, obviously after they do all the work and do all the fun stuff, sometimes I just sit down and play video games with them just to engage with them. And it's important to have that powerful bonding experience. Your ability to experience their childhood with them gives you a chance to sort of relive your own childhood, which is really powerful. And not only do you want to teach your children, but you can learn from your children, probably rewarding and enriching to learn from them as well. And then again, give them the tools, give them the framework of how to think versus just the answers. I guess my last message here is help them create more curiosity in their life, playfulness, forgiveness for yourself, forgiveness for them, compassion passion and really, you know, pour into them because really there you're going to be your legacy. Happiness is key. And one of the things they say for happiness really is social fitness. It's not bank accounts. It's not, you know, companies. It's not traveling. It's really having sort of seven main categories of social support, which will translate into well-lived, happy life. Safety and security, you know, is one of the categories, learning and growth, emotional closeness, identity, rom romantic um, connections, you know, when you need some help or some assistance and then fun relaxations. Let's get into this. So 
for safety and security, like in the middle of the night, if something ha happened, who do you call for an emergency, right? You need to have someone like that in your life, learning and growth. Like who are your growth friends or learning friends? They're not necessarily someone you hang with all the time, but they're, when you hang out with them, you learn something new, you, you grow, you're expanding your capabilities. There are people who reaffirm your identity. They're like, you know, they help you, you enjoy who you are. You know, if you're a physician, there are probably people around you who reaffirm your identity as a physician. Romantic, uh, you know, I don't care what sexual orientation you are, but we all need companionship in life. We all need someone, you know, perhaps even romantic in our life. And that's important. It just gives more meaning in that category. And then finally, if you need help, hey, you know, I, my computer doesn't work or hey, I have something in my house that's broken. Is there someone in that, that can help you tackle those problems? Or hey, look, I don't know how to invest invest in, you know, my 401k or something like that. Then finally, you need your fun friends or your people who make you laugh that are silly that they don't take you so seriously, right? In my life, for example, these are my college friends. I don't care how big I, I become or what I've accomplished. They make sure they humble me. They keep me in check. They make fun of me. And they're just like, they like me for me, regardless of what I've done or who I've become. These are the seven categories, guys. This is what they've studied. So if you want happiness, start thinking about getting these cornerstones of social support. Addition through subtraction, the power of simplicity. As we progress in life and we keep taking on more tasks, taking on more projects, creating more companies, accumulating more stuff in our home, things get complicated. But you want to consider the power of less is more the power of minimalism, the power of simplification. So over time, take stock, take inventory. What are all the things in your credit card bill, for example, that you don't need anymore? Start canceling subscriptions and things like that. Clothes, if you haven't worn them in a year, you're probably not, you don't like them, you don't need them anymore. Give them out, you know? And this weight comes off your shoulder and comes off yourself and you feel lighter, which is good. Are there relationships that you've sort of outgrown? I just talked about relationships that are important, but then there are relationships that don't really serve you. If they're toxic relationships or they're sort of, they're they're not growing and you are, maybe it's time to let them go. And then that's okay. Are there divisions of your company? What I call sacred cows that we slay. There are things where like, I had this division of my company where we we're doing in-person immersion events. And it just didn't make sense because my main focus is acquiring more assets in Viking Capital. And so we shut down that division that was doing these intensive immersion events because it was sucking things out of my company. It was not as profitable and it was taking a lot of my team's time and it didn't lead to the results that I wanted. And then things, even in your body, if I, like doing things like there's something called Prolon. It's a five-day fasting mimicking diet. And you can essentially sort of reset your body by going through this five-day program. It's essentially 1,100 calories day one and 800 calories day two through five. And you feel so good. It's giving your body a rest and you rejuvenate your stem cells and your skin and all that kind of stuff. So I've given you areas of life for simplification, for minimalism, for essentialism. It's a key category for continued growth, for happiness, and for unburdening yourself. Next, becoming a time architect. Many people have money. Some people have time. Few have both. And I want to show you how to have both. Remember the AADE philosophy. So AADE stands for using artificial intelligence. There's so many artificial intelligence apps out there that can help you save you hours of time. Next is automate. What can you automate in your life? Next is delegate. What can you delegate and give out and get off your plate? And what can you eliminate? There are things, again, you just take off because they're not part of your goals. They're not going to help you achieve your outcomes. They're unneeded, unnecessary. One way to think about how you spend your time is to do what I call a love and loathe list. What does that mean? Take a piece of paper and at the top, put love and put hate. All the things you love doing in your day, your business, your career, whatever, and what you hate doing. And once you know those things, you double down of the things you love, which ones will help you translate into your personal outcomes or personal goals or your business outcomes, your business goals. And the ones you don't like doing, even though they may help contribute to your goals, those are the things you want to either delegate, automate or eliminate. You also want to create an ideal week. If Aladdin came out of it, the lamp and gave you three wishes and you created your absolute ideal week, this is what I want most of my weeks to look like. What does that look like? And once you understand that, let's start reverse engineering that, right? And what I've noticed is the most successful people in the world, the one percenters of the world, they put their vacations, their passions and things that are super important to them into the calendar first at the beginning when they do their annual planning. And then everything else fits into that. Your businesses and your companies and your income should fit into your life, not the other way around. All right, guys. Next comes a hell yes or no mindset. To be honest with you, this is one of the most 
pivotal things that I've incorporated into my life and it's made a huge difference. No more doing things out of obligation. You feel that you need to do this for other people. You have a very short amount of time in your life and you should really, this is from Derek Seavers. He has this concept really, if it's not a hell yes, it eventually becomes a no. So by you doing this, you have a litmus test. You have a barometer. You have a divide that you do things that are going to fulfill your goals, objectives, dreams, they're supporting the people you love or they're supporting you. Stop doing things just because you should or obligation or you're sort of want to kind of because that just slows you down and it adds unnecessary things in your life. So keep it crystal clear. When asked to do something, anything with your time needs to be a hell yes or a no, nothing in between. And if you say yes to the thing that are not important, you steal time away from the magical things in your life. So remember this and live by this. It really will help you. Since we're on this topic, I'll tell you the sort of the three big themes that really influenced me, uh, three or four big themes. This hell yes or hell no, anything I touch turns to gold, but I must touch it long enough and I can only touch one thing at a time. Next is elf and half, which I've described already. And finally, if something takes me toward the freedoms, I move toward it. If it takes me away from the freedoms, I don't do it. So these are just my general principles, my general frameworks that help guide me to sort of what I think is sort of my ideal life that I'm getting to live now. But it wasn't always like this. And this is these are the frameworks that help me get here. So the next one is sequential versus simultaneous goal achievement. Many of you listening to this YouTube podcast, etc. The problem with you guys is you want to do it all. And I get this as well. Like two types of people that come into my coaching program. One is the kind of people I have to kick in their ass so they can move forward and achieve things. They just need that oomph for the motivation. Not necessarily the best clients, but those are some of the people that sometimes slip through the cracks. The second type of person that I have the privilege of coaching is the person that do, they want to do it all. And my my goal is for them, for me to pull back the reins on many of the things they're doing and lay, help them laser focus on their major transformative purpose, their big, hairy, audacious goal, their mission in life. And once they do that, everything else becomes easier or unnecessary. So go after your, you know, your mighty few in your mission, and that will allow you to unfold and do so many other things in life. As I mentioned, anything I touch turns to gold, but I much touch it long enough. Prioritize and future pace your critical goals and vision you have already accomplished it every morning. And so inevitably you're being drawn toward that possibility, toward that future. This is how you do these big moonshot dreams, right? You stop cluttering your life with all these minor goals that, you know, even if you hit it, it didn't really give you that joy, the fulfillment, that success that you're really craving. But just going after these, you know, somewhat scary, daunting, but if you get it to, even if you hit even 70% of the goal, 80% of the goal, it will change your absolute entire life. That's the kind of goals we want. And eventually you'll get all your goals done. But what happened is like, for example, one of my goals was uh, physical fitness. So I really focused on my physical fitness. It became part of who I am. I incorporated into my identity. So physical fitness was my identity. I didn't have to think about it anymore. It allowed me to open up bandwidth and space to go after a second thing. Once I incorporated that, achieved it, and it became sort of second nature, boom, I'm able to go after a third thing, etc. So I mastered cardiology or I got to the point where cardiology was where I didn't even have to think about it. I was able to do it at a high level. Then I worked on on functional medicine and was able to incorporate that, envision that. And I talked about business building. Then I talked about real estate. Then I incorporated that. Then I incorporated how to launch a coaching program, figured out how to do that. And then I'm talking about how do I scale things? How do I create multiple streams of income? figure that out. How do I become a good dad? Okay, I'm learning that. And this is the story of life. You want to do it all, I get it. But choose thing that makes sense first. Go after it, accomplish it, incorporate it, make it into one of your identities. Then you can go after the second goal. All right, protecting your wealth, avoiding mistakes. This is super important. Very few people talk about the mistakes millionaires make. And I want to just cut through the BS and share these with you because there's nothing in the world that fails like success. I'll say that again. Nothing in your world can fail like success. Why am I saying that? Because I've known so many people who quote unquote made it, but then in a couple of years, they've lost it all or you know they really messed up and they had to recover. And there's no need for that by you taking care of these things. So these are the mistakes that millionaires make, guys. So pay attention here. Before I go into those mistakes, I want to talk about how to anticipate things. You want to think about things like a chess master. In chess, there's different levels in chess. And, and 
a typical amateur, for example, thinks one to three moves ahead. So your rook takes my pawn. I'm like, oh my God, I need to think, okay, I'll do this because he's going to come out and get me next. A pro thinks four to five moves ahead. A master thinks six to 10 moves ahead. A grandmaster thinks 11 to 15 moves ahead. So you can see as you're starting to see action, counteraction, doing a task and thinking about the consequences. And as your experience builds and as your knowledge builds and as your group of influence builds, Builds, you're able to foresee the future. Remember, history does not repeat itself, but it rhymes. And so learning the lessons of history, learning the lessons from experience of others, of yourself, you're able to be anticipatory and to be proactive versus reactive. You know, the famous uh, saying of Wayne Gretzky, he used to skate to not where the puck is, but where the puck is going. With that said, let's get into these mistakes. These are the major mistakes millionaires make. And I urge you all to see if any of these could apply to you and not to make them. Okay. So we'll get into it here. Number one, businesses should always retain cash balances or have significant cash reserves. This is very especially true. I'm recording this during the 2023 economic correction, potentially recession. There are a lot of businesses that are going under or there are businesses that are str struggling because they don't have enough cash reserves. So this is important. During capital or liquidity events, make sure to diversify the assets and create financial plan to protect your lifestyle. A lot of people, they sell their private equity, they sell their companies, they get a huge windfall and they just put all their money back into one thing or two things, you know, and they're hoping for that next big windfall. It could work and that's great. But if you had just diversified some of that income into other streams of income versus just one major stream of income or one major asset class that provides some protection because you're diversified. And if, if something goes after that one asset class, you haven't lost at all. So it's almost like, when you go to Vegas and you make a huge win, you take some of the money off the table. When starting up a new company, after the successful sale of your previous business, make sure you have outside investors who perform better and have less risk of losing wealth. Many doctors, entrepreneurs, this is the problem I see. They have money because obviously they're earning high incomes or they've done some good investments and they have cash and they want to go solo on everything. There's power in going in as a group. There's power in knowing that you have other stakeholders involved. Also, it shares not only are you um, able to do more investments because you have more money, because at some point you're going to run out of your own money. So by incorporating OPM, other people's money, it's very good. And number two, you have other people to answer to. And so it makes you to be super cautious. Next, maintaining your mental, emotional, and physical self, even through the worst of times. Physical fitness should never be let go. It should never be slacked upon. Um, you need that. That's sort of the secret weapon that helps you withstand the onslaught of uncertainty, ups and downs of business challenges, right? Maintaining good mindset. This comes after I've talked about hitting all the five freedoms, figured out physicality and how to have ultimate vitality. You figured out how to have an unshakable, resilient mindset, right? You figured out wealth and you figured out time and you figured out perhaps being able to do it from anywhere in the world. So having that core foundation will allow you to sort of navigate even the worst of times. Half of of all the decisions made by you and your company are wrong. It's up to you to decide which of those decisions are important enough to kill you and focus on those to and make sure you get them right. You don't have to always get it right, but make sure you get the critical things right. In times of revenue crisis, reduce overhead immediately. Some people don't do this quick enough and they're, they're struggling. It can put their company at jeopardy. So learn to, during good times, you know, there's uh, events, there's parties, there's, um, you know, you're sharing revenue, there's profit sharing, there's bonuses. But during lean times, you got to stay lean in your company. Otherwise, you're going to run out of capital, which goes back to the first one. First thing I talked about, which is retaining cash balances. All right. I hope you're with me. I hope these make sense. These are the mistakes millionaires make, guys. And if you think you're too good or you think that this is not going to apply to you, you're in for a rude awakening. So please pay attention. This is taken from real life examples of millionaires who've effed up. So understand that vast majority of acquisitions vast underperform expectations. Be careful to be realistic, not overtly optimistic. Again, we as entrepreneurs, we as business owners, we as overall rational optimists always want to expect the best. But by having that realistic, what I saw cautiously opportunistic and cautiously realistic viewpoints will save you in the long run. Next, being open in your communication, transparent with employees, vendors, investors, and clients through hard times is important. If you're not able to pay your investors on time, let them know, explain why, share your reasoning. They'll be forgiving. They'll have some compassion. Some will be angry. That's okay. But it's better to be upfront. No need for any kind of Bernie Madoff, you know, shenanigans here. The more open and honest and transparent you are, the more likely you'll build trust and respect. In fact, I have a mentor of mine. I think he owns 
you know, billion dollars of retail real estate in the DC, Virginia area. And during some of the hard times, he lost uh, some of his investors' money. And he was upfront, he was honest, he told them what's going on. He kept updated every step of the way. And guess what? Even after he lost people's money, they reinvested with him. That's the power of just being a good operator and a good business owner and a good person. Borrow conservatively. There are cycles when debt's cheap and there's cycles when you over leverage. So you want to avoid that. You want to just take whatever debt you need because taking too much debt and for, if it's floating rate debt or debt that can change with times, that's very dangerous to your business. In general, if you're a business owner, you want to avoid recourse loans where if something goes wrong with the business, no fault of your own, they can come after your personal. You don't want that. You know, personal guarantees are sometimes needed, but you want to just let the business be the business and your personal will be separate. Okay. Uh, if you want to act as an angel investor, again, cherry pick and you know selectively distribute your funds or, or across multiple investments instead of going all in on one thing because you, you don't know which one's going to pan out. And the typical model is, you know, out of the 10 investments you spend sprinkle money into one of them is going to be a home run two or three are going to be pretty good you know seven are going to be dogs so that's sort of the statistics there so this is a uh, very important guys when you have a little about a money or a little bit of wealth the return on your investment is important when you have a substantial amount of money or wealth you want to focus on preservation capital preservation not on the return on your investments and so depending on where you are in your journey for wealth creation, equity creation, uh, multiple streams of income, you know, legacy building. Decide, is it more about preserving and slightly improving what you have or is it really rapidly growing what you have? And that will help decide your investment strategy. And finally, guys, this is so key and I've been guilty of this myself too, but you got to maintain humility. Don't believe the press. Don't believe all the hype, right? You're not as good as everyone says you are. You're not as bad as everyone says you are, right? The, the truth is somewhere in the middle. So family first, that's number one. They'll be ride or die with you, your spouse, your kids, your parents, your business partners. Those are your essentially your family. And that's very important. And it's one of the most important things in the world. So don't ever neglect that. Don't ever take it for granted. Guys, that's the mistakes that millionaires make. Don't make them. Okay. As we're coming up to the end of this super in-depth presentation and how to become exponential, how to cheap escape velocity, how to create moonshot goals, and how to go beyond what everyone in the world always talks about, which is freedoms. F the freedoms. They're good. They're important. But there's a next level beyond that. And that's what we're talking about today. Growing your wealth. There are six levels of investors. There's level one. You're a novice. You don't know what you don't know. You're just getting to the game. Fine. None of you who are listening to this are at this level. I know that. Number two, you're a saver. Remember, savers are losers. If all you do is save a little bit of what you earn, put into some low interest bearing account, fine. It's better than, I guess, spending everything you got, but not anywhere near where you need to be. Next is level three. You're an amateur. You're starting to invest. You're starting to play in the market. Now you're doing some retirement savings now. You're like, okay, I'm getting to the game. Good for you. At least you got started. But level four is really where we start playing the real game. This is the real money game that the 1%, top 20% of the world plays. You're a professional. You've actually studied markets. You have a little bit of investor edu education. You're starting to become what we call sophisticated. And you are able to now start navigating complex financial situations. And you're taking back the range. You're not just blindly following some random financial advisor whom you have a higher net worth than them and hoping that they know what to do with your money. That's really low level thinking. That's amateur level. You want to become a professional. If you get to professional level, kudos. That's the minimum level you need to play to really achieve wealth in this society today. Next is learning to be a capitalist. It's You've done years of professional investing. You've invested in other people's projects. Now you're starting to design, create, and offer opportunities for others to invest with you. This is eventually being, you know, creating syndications. That's, you know, it's actually a security that people invest. You create opportunities, you create a franchise. Other people can invest with you. You offer shares in your businesses, your company, your surgical care centers, in your practice, right? So you're starting to become more of a capitalist. And then there's what I call level six. You're a venture capitalist or an angel investor your private equity. You're at the point where you take leadership positions in high level investments. You provide guidance, you provide mentorship, you understand. And when they sell or exit, you get a huge piece of equity and a huge cash out. That's the ultimate level, level six. Whatever you want to do, decide where you are on this evolution scale, this pyramid, and figure out where you want to end up. If you have the goal, go become a professional. If you really want to go after it, go for the capitalist. And eventually, if it makes sense, I welcome you to become a venture capital or an angel investor. Because this 
this is not as well spoken in the physician entrepreneurship circles, I want to spend a few minutes on it. This is my goal. I've hit the capitalist thing. My goal is to become an angel, a venture capital an advisor, private equity myself. And the goal is knowing what my outcome and role is. I want to promote, help, grow, and support businesses that are humanity positive. That will change and disrupt archaic business models currently. I think medicine is ripe for disruption. I think healthcare is. I think coaching is. I think education is. I think technology is. And so those are the fields I'm interested in. I'm interested in biotech. I'm interested in all these things. And as I gained a ton of experience in running my own businesses, you know, and I, I, I still continue to mature and learn from others, I want to pass it on to other folks. And so I get pitched all the time from people on their businesses and their business ideas. And over time, similar to that show Shark Tank, which I know you guys watch, they get pitched all the time. The goal to becoming a shark or to, to her really becoming a savvy angel investor is to understand there's a lot of noise from the substance. And you're able to pick and choose what actually makes sense and what why you know that business is going to be successful and this won't. You'll start analyzing term sheets and you'll understand evaluations. You'll understand how to manage a portfolio of different investments that you, you've done. And you'll help navigate these exits for those investments that you're part of. All right, guys, as we start wrapping up here, I want to talk about legacy and impact. Because in the end, what's the point of it all? Why are we struggling? Why are we using our precious resource of time and energy on this earth in this lifespan that we live? And for what purpose, right? It's really to make that dent in the universe. It's to have massive income and massive impact. And so one of the things I want to do is I want to invest once or I want to donate once and have my investment go on for eternity, infinity. How do I do that? There's something called inf infinite charity. So you get a nonprofit and the nonprofit can invest in assets and the returns on those assets then are used for everything else. And there's a way to do this. You can choose an investment vehicle such as a donor advised fund as actually a foundation or a nonprofit. And you can do different things. Talk to your financial advisor about this. The next thing is what are the values of the charity or the nonprofit and where do they you want them to invest in? things that are aligned with, with your values. Impact investing will be very huge over the next 10 to 15 to 20 years. People are using money as and their donations as a voice for what they believe in and what they want to promote. ESG, environmental, so social, and governments investing, right? There are many companies, especially in European companies that are coming to the US and they have an ESG mandate on where they want to invest. Thematic investing, you know, investing in education, investing in underprivileged opportunities for kids, scholarships, investing in health benefits in villages. And then obviously we've talked about impact investing. So how does it work for these infinite charities? Again, the the charities themselves now, you start building assets for the charities. They get long-term savings, long-term cash flow. And because they're doing this, they're, they're considered sort of smarter, or more savvier uh, charitable vehicles that will actually attract uh, larger checks because they're like, man, my money's going a lot further. Similar to raising capital for deals or raising capital for businesses, there are cycles for raising capital for charities. And you know, during good times, everyone donates to charity. During bad times, or it's tougher to raise money for charities because people are just trying to struggle and ma maintain themselves. So this allows these charities to be relatively independent of those cycles because their charities don't have to always depend on new funds going in because the funds that are already invested are, are creating dollars all the time. It can deepen that charitable impact. So again, infinite charities. Consider the concept and adapt it. You know, I am speaking. Speaking to my brethren here, my brothers and sisters who are doctors, and if you're a doctor or you're in the healthcare field, then even if you retire from medicine, even if you're able to do other things, you're always going to be an MD. You're always going to be a doctor. You're always going to be a DO. You're always going to be someone who has the gift of healing. And one of the things I want to do is I want to create these medical missions where, you know, uh, on top of the tourism and the volunteerism and all the other things I want to do, I want to travel and help during crisis. And there's, you know, companies like Medicines Sans Frontiers. I'm sure I didn't say that correctly, but Doctors Without Borders, for those of you who know the American name of it. But there in, we recently had an earthquake in 2023 in Turkey and Syria. And there are doctors out there who were deployed immediately to help out. So if you have the time freedom, if you've created financial freedom, you've created geographic freedom, and you really want to give back and 
and get, have impact and get your hands dirty and really help. What better way than doing these kind of medical missions? So uh, whether you're creating the medical mission yourself, you're joining someone else's medical mission, you're just gathering supplies to ship to an underserved area in the world. This feels good. This is alignment with our Hippocratic Oath to always help others. And I think it's very meaningful and very powerful. And then finally, guys, you got to document your life. Why? Because I think you've probably learned some critical lessons in your journey. You've figured out realizations. You have insights. And these insights should be passed on to your friends, your family, to your kids, to the world. You have what you are worthy. You are someone of value. I'm telling you that because it's true. And so people like Phil Knight, who wrote Shoe Dog, his the memoir of Nike, phenomenal book, or Elon Musk, uh, Ashley Vance wrote this book about Elon. It literally is what inspired me to buy my first Tesla, it inspired me to think big, and it literally changed my life when I read that book. So if a book can change someone's life, why can't your book do the same? And so perhaps you're writing your journal, your book, your story. There's so, so many ways to do that. There's people who can interview you over eight interviews and boom, you're they create a memoir for you. What am I doing right now? I am starting to share my journey and my life history and the lessons, whatever I've learned on YouTube, because I think it's important. Instagram, you know, Twitter, this is how you should use social media, not to show, oh, look at me, I did this, right? Uh, and it's like making other people feel bad because you live um, a highly curated, selected life that you share on social media. No, that's low level thinking. I want you to have an intrinsic motivation to really uplift your fellow man and woman, right? This is how you do it. And so what I urge you to do is capture these lessons. This is for in the modern day, you know, in the ancient days, you know, as I mentioned, I was in Egypt. I saw the lessons of these people on the walls of the hieroglyphics. We've learned from Marcus Aurelius and his book, Meditations, right? Because he wrote a book and, and we we're able to find that. But in this day and age of technology and media, this is a way to share your message. Okay. And with that, guys, my final, final, final message, never peak, never, never, never peak. There's greatness inside of you. Harness it, ignite it, galvanize it, and reach higher than you ever have done before and be the absolute best version of yourself. It's easier to 10X your life than 2X your life. So with that said, guys, let's go. Always got your back. If you need anything, reach out to us. My name is Vikram Raya, LimitlessMD, VikramRaya.com. You know, if there's anything we can do to support you, leave it in the comments below, but let's go. I got your back.